Welcome to the inaugural episode of the J.P. Eisenhower Show. I'm your host, J.P. Eisenhower, here this week with special guest Andrew Feeney to talk about the top headlines from the NFL this week. The first topic is going to be Kareem Hunt returns to the Browns this week. Can this spark the Browns' offense? No. Here's the thing. The Browns have skill players. They have skill players galore. There's no reason that Kareem Hunt is going to play any difference in this. What do you think? I think... It might make a difference, but if it doesn't, it's bad news for Freddie. When you look at it, the Browns' offense is broken, and Freddie Kitchens was supposed to be this offensive genius coming into the season. If Kareem Hunt can't at least add more production to that offense, Freddie's one and done this year. Well, you know what? The, the big reason he's not going to play that much of a difference is because they don't have an O-line. They, they really traded don't. away their own line And just like the Giants for the past two, three years— they had the skill players. They had Odell Beckham. They had Sterling Shepard, Saquon Barkley, and Evan Ingram. It didn't matter because their O-line was so bad that they couldn't compete. Yeah, the problem, though, isn't even the running game for the Browns' offense. It's really the no. passing game. They're getting good push up front in the run game, but in the passing game, Baker's running for his life. Yeah, Baker, that's just a whole other topic about that. I mean, wow. Maybe for another episode, but yeah. the next one, as of Tuesday— the Jaguars announced that Nick Foles will be the starting quarterback over Garner Minshew. Is this the right decision? As much as I love Minshew mania and that he was, it was awesome, the stash, everything about it. And I, I, I thoroughly believe that he will be a good quarterback and a starting quarterback in this league, maybe even in Jacksonville after Nick Foles' reign. However, Minshew has posted a 46 QBR. That is... That's, that's just awful. I mean, he's a young guy, and you can't really blame just him because the Jaguars have not been very well, good this year. But I just I just don't think that Minshew's... I think Foles is... It's the right move. I think, I think Foles should be the starter. I get why they made the move. I understand you paid Foles all this money in the offseason. He's guaranteed all this money. You want a return on your investment into Nick Foles. I think this is the wrong decision for the Jaguars, though. Really? When you have a young player playing as good as he's played, except for one game, which was the last game, And it's in London, jet lag. There's a lot of problems that we could go in with some London games that some great players have played poorly in those games. But when you look at it, Minshew is balling out, and he's a young player. When you have a young player making incredible plays, moving in the pocket like Patrick Mahomes, I mean, you see on some of these throws, like one to Chris Conley just two weeks ago, he's making incredible plays that Nick Foles can't make. Nick Foles is a great quarterback, but I think Gardner Minshew has the ability to be better, and that's why I think... You start him and you develop him. Here's here's my counterpoint to that. As much as I I told you I love I love Gardner Minshew, but Nick Foles is a Super Bowl champion, and right now he is the better quarterback. He's the guy that's going to help them con- uh, succeed. However, maybe they pull a Patty Mahomes situation like uh, Andy Reid did in Kansas City, where they sit Minshew out for like the next year, year and a half and then let him develop under Nick Foles, who is a fantastic quarterback, can't deny he's Super Bowl champion, and then they have this amazing starter after Foles goes, Foles's prime is over, they have Minshew. I think that's the move for them. Yeah, and I think we all knew Foles was going to end up starting after they didn't trade him at the trade deadline. I honestly, I still got to go with Minshew mania. I've been on his hype train the entire way, and I'm going to stay on it. Uh if Full starts struggling, I think Minshew comes off the bench, and I think he takes it and runs with it, though. I don't disagree. I fully agree with that. The next topic will be, will Antonio Brown find a job? We looked at it, and the Seahawks reached out to him when they were looking for a receiver. This is before they signed Josh Gordon, and they decided to sign Josh Gordon over him. What does that tell you about Antonio Brown and possibly getting a job this season? As much as I hate hate and despise Antonio Brown. He's going to find a job in the NFL. Who are we kidding? I mean, there's so many teams that could use a talent like that and are willing to take on that whole character and not just, but take on that whole character just for the talent that they would get on the field. I got to disagree a little bit there. I agree that he's going to get a job, but I do not think it's going to be this year. I mean, you look at it, the Seahawks chose Josh Gordon who it's been well documented all the problems he's had over Antonio Brown, that says something about what the league thinks about his character and his off-the-field antics. They're not trusting him to be able to clean up off the field, and he's still got 
pending criminal cases. I don't think until those are over, he's definitely not getting a job. Oh, I wouldn't take him. It won't be this year. It won't be this year. I can guarantee that. I mean, if if he does get a job, which I I think he will, unfortunately, some GM will take a risk on that. Uh, it's not going to be this year. Maybe, maybe even not next year. I mean, the guy's just got so much on his hands right now. And after this, he's going to have a suspension, and he's – he made a ton of appeals trying to get money. He's trying to get his fully guaranteed contract from the Raiders. There is no way that the Raiders should be paying him any of that money. If you showed up to like three or four practices, didn't play in a game, and was cut before the season even starts, same with the Pats. You get paid for the week you play. The guarantees mean nothing. If it's conduct detrimental to the team, the contract can be voided. And I think he's going to lose all those appeals. And not just that. When you look at all the problems he's been having in the offseason, I mean, I can't even list off all of them without probably missing one. He's had so many. I mean, the recent case that just closed where he was throwing furniture out of the his hotel room and almost hit a child by the pool, and then he's got pending criminal cases for rape. I don't, I don't think it's a very good idea for a team to try to take that risk right now, and even when he eventually gets a job, he'll be handed a fairly long suspension. I agree. Now for the last one. This is one that I am very passionate Been about. waiting for this one. The P.I. rule is broken, and it's more controversial than it even was. I mean, you look at pass interference. One time in the past five years, and that's that Rams-Saints game, can I remember there being a controversy about pass interference? Now it seems like it's by game. What does... What is wrong with this pass interference rule? Uh, there's just been no purpose to it whatsoever. I mean, you've had... you You've always had angry coaches at pass interference calls but like they move on because it's not that big of a deal now in the saints rams game that was completely different and in the chiefs uh versus colts yes this chiefs year with Colt. that i don't know how I, that play stands yeah i mean there's and the stat i tried to find a stat online but could not because of my firewall at my school however the reason that it, it's just there's no teams are going to challenge it because their teams have and there's been no success rate. And every time they challenge it and get it wrong, they lose a timeout. I mean, you look at it just yesterday, there were two questionable pass interference calls. I think the problem isn't, I mean, it is the rule. But another problem with the rule is now referees feel like they don't have to get it right. They're a little bit more lenient on how they're calling it. They're letting more go or they're calling it fairly quickly in the uh progression of the play and when you look at it it's just all in all a bad decision i mean you're looking at blatant pass interferences or blatant non-pass interferences standing because the nfl won't overturn any of these and it's just they need to scrap the rule and completely get rid of this or what they need to do is go to the college game and take that targeting rule and use that as an outline for this Either they have to say it is pass interference or it is not. They can no longer say it stands. I agree because the stance thing has made so many people mad. Because there needs to be concrete evidence whether it is or it's not. I just, I think it's all of this is really just an overreaction to one play. I don't think this was even in conversation before that NFC championship game. I think reviewing penalties, I think this is a movement towards reviewing penalties and I don't like it. Because think about it this way. The catch. 49ers go to the Super Bowl. It's incredible. They look back at that play because the Cowboys coach challenges a holding. There's a small hold on the left tackle. The play is erased from history. When you start reviewing penalties, there are penalties on every play that go uncalled because they're just little. But once you start reviewing penalties, that gets away great plays. It slows down the game, and it's not as fun to watch. Exactly. That's the biggest point because there are penalties every play. There's a penalty every play. Who are we kidding? I mean, the holding from the offensive line, illegal hands to the face, all these simple little things that would slow down the game so much just because a player complains. And the refs aren't going to be perfect. There's no way that'll ever happen. It's not possible. I think no matter what, people are going to have a problem with penalties. You just need to not have a replay system. It's just going to make it worse. Yep. Coaches are losing challenges, losing timeouts, and it's really costing them in games in the long term. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's just it's not a good move for the NFL right now. It um, it just doesn't make sense. The it prolongs the game. It makes coaches like feel like the when the player complains it, and the coach has confidence in it, he throws the flag. The he's play, never gonna get it right. He's never gonna get it right. It's, it's not even it's worth always challenging anymore. It's never. It. I don't think it's been confirmed once. I mean, like, there was one on Deion. There was a couple that 
they uh it hasn't been confirmed. It's been mm-hmm. stands or it's been overturned. Yes. But I mean, you look at the one on DeAndre Baker. I didn't think it was pass interference at all. And they're calling him and they're reviewing it and they said stands. And, and then later I don't understand. later in the game, I mean, the DeAndre Baker ha- had a clear pass interference call on him that was not pass interference, but Pat Shermer was afraid to fl- throw the flag because he would have lost another crucial timeout. That's going to wrap it up this week. Remember to listen in next week as I'll be joined by Connell Scruggs to talk college football. Thanks to special guest Andrew Feeney for joining me this week. Thank you, JP. All right, that's going to be it. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week on the JP Eisenhower Show.